Well, welcome once again. Uh, glad that you're with us again uh, today. This is session 14 of our uh, life school class, foreigner school class, uh, called The Theology of the Bride. Uh, and this is part two of our uh, two sessions on Come Out of Her, My People. The title of this one is Come Out of Her, My People, part two. This is session 14. So we have this session and then one more after that, and we'll be through with, with the session. Um, and so if you, hopefully you um, did watch or read the notes of session 13, which was Come Out of Her, My People, part one. Uh, but in that session and in this session as well, we'll be dealing with uh, Revelation chapter 18 and 17, uh, where in 18.4, uh, a voice from heaven tells John, come out of her, my people, uh, that you don't participate in or receive of her plagues and participate of her sins. Uh, and so we'll read that in, in exactly here in, in just a minute. So we dealt with that in the last session in the context of come out of allegiance uh, with this Babylonian system, this uh, the, the Babylon the Great, the mystery Babylon. You know, we dealt with three aspects of, of it, of this system. Remember we talked about it being a city on many waters that included many people and nations and tongues uh, so it was, a glo in a sense, a global city or a large uh, city, probably a revived Roman Empire based on Revelation 17, uh, 18, where it's the great city, which was probably at that time was Rome, and that would be the, uh, probably the, the foundation of it or at least part of the, the, uh, the, the, where, where the city was, was uh, headquartered or, or, or trait that would show us about the city. So we talked about coming out of that and the three aspects of it was the, the governmental aspect of it, the governmental control, the economic and monetary system control, uh, and the religious control, those three things, and how we needed to resist being in allegiance with that system, especially in any way that causes us to compromise our faith, that caused us to walk away uh, from Christ or to resist him or to compromise our faith there. So we dealt with that in the last session about coming out of allegiance with this mystery Babylon. Uh, and in this session, we want to deal with one other aspect of it is to come out of the abominations that she has, uh, that she is leading people into, the abominations and the immoralities of that. Uh, so let me pray, and then we'll we'll deal uh, do a little bit of explanation of, it, and then we'll go into uh, this coming out of her uh, abominations, which is kind of like a fourth aspect. And we got the government, the economy, the religion, and then the fourth one being the abominations that's in her golden cup. So anyway, let me pray, and then we'll get started with that. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to to gather and to study your word. And Lord, it is our desire that we would come out of this mystery Babylon, this great harlot, that we would come out completely, both of her sins and of allegiance with the system that will cause us to compromise our faith. We ask for you to give us insight, give us discernment, give us wisdom as to what to do and help us to walk in uh, really great purity Father, because we know that the bride has, is a pure bride wearing clean, pure linen garments. And we want to be, we want to walk in that level of purity. It is our desire to do that in the name of Jesus. So take me out of the way, Lord, and speak again through me in whatever way you want to choose, what you choose to help those who will watch this to walk free of these things. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Um, all right, just a little bit of review. Remember in the last session we talked about the contrast between the true bride and the bridal city uh, and the harlot, uh, that the bridal city was a, uh, the new Jerusalem was a bride made ready 
there was uh, Christ was in the center of it. Uh, it's a bride. The city is both a city and a bride. It is a, it's a it's those who have overcome. It's the it's the pure uh, bride who would who would reside there, and in a, in a number of other things. But in a contrast to that, there is this uh, Babylon the Great, this mystery Babylon. Uh, who is called a harlot, in fact, the mother of harlotries, the mother uh, of the abominations of the earth. Uh, and we, the, the scripture that we're, we'll read it here again in a minute, was the call was to come out of that, come out of that Babylonian system, both in allegiance and into this end of the sins of that system, so that we can be made ready as a bride, as part of the readying process of the bride being made ready. So let's read a little bit uh, about the harlot, the great harlot. And let's, let me read uh, again some that we read in the last session, but I'll read it again. Uh, verse seven, chapter 17, verse 1. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I shall show you the judgment of the great harlot. So this is talking about the great harlot who sits on the many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality. Now, probably primarily that's talking about spiritual immorality. Uh, and those who dwell on the earth made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, <coughs> full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And it goes back to the woman here again. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and she was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. And she here, here's what I want you to hear. One of the uh, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. She, so she's holding a cup. This woman is holding a cup. Golden cup, beautiful on the outside, but filled with abominations uh, and the unclean things of her immorality. So we see the contrast here. The bride is clean, dressed in fine linen, clean and bright. The harlot is, holds a cup filled with unclean things of her immorality. And then verse 5. And upon her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great. And it says this, the mother of harlots. And, uh, and so it would also be the mother of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And so what we see, you know, last session we dealt with the the, the city, the, the, the government, the economy, and the religion. And here we see, in addition to that, she's holding a cup filled with abominations and unclean things, and that she is the mother of harlots and the mother of the abominations of the earth. Uh, and it says, now let's see our, the exhortation to us, going to chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, uh, having great authority, and the earth was illumined uh, with his glory. And he, cr he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and she has become a dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and, ha and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion, of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And now here's the exhortation. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive of her plagues. Now, he says, come out of her so you don't participate in her sins. Now, 
you know, her sins would include the things we talked about in the last session about allegiance to the system. But her sins also include those unclean things that are in the then in this golden cup that are filled with abominations and immoralities. And so the Lord is saying here, not only do we come out of allegiance with this harlot, we need to come out of participation in the sins that this harlot system is just pouring out upon the earth, which is affecting essentially every nation of the earth. And the Lord is saying, come out of all that. Here's the point. The bride made ready will come out completely of these abominations of the sins of this harlot, this global harlot. Uh, it's a real urgent call. It's an important call. It's an essential call for the bride to be made ready. Um, and what we see is that these abominations are all over the earth right now, massively in the earth, and the church is not exempt from them, not at all exempt from them. In fact, we'll talk about this more later in the session, but the church, in, a, in an attempt to try to reach people, uh, in an attempt to be accepted uh, for whatever reason is compromising greatly right now with these things that are called abominations uh, to the Lord. So I want to deal with what that means uh, in this. So, you know, we, we, as you look at this, I, I'll just re re repeat a little bit of this, of the scriptures. Uh, she's made drunk with the wine of her immorality, 17.2. Her gold cup is full of abominations and of unclean things. She is the mother of harlots and the mother of abominations of the earth. 18.3. For all the, nations have, all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality with her. And the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her. Uh, so we begin to, to see that there's a, th these things about abominations and the, uh, and the unclean things. And look, before we get into the depth of this, let's look at what the meaning of abominations means and, and immoralities as well. Uh, if you look, let's look first at abominations. The English dictionary defines abominations as anything greatly disliked or abhorred. The definition further describes abomination as anything vile, uh, detestable, or shameful. Uh, comment, commenting on the word as it's used in the scriptures, uh, Tom, Robert Thomas, again, we mentioned him. He wrote this two-volume commentary on the book of Revelation. He includes this about abominations. Abominations was a characteristic term for idols in the Old Testament. Uh, here it denotes ceremonial and moral, ceremony and moral impurity, but especially idolatrous rites. These are blasphemous activities that God detests, and the harlot's cup is full of them. Uh, now let's look at immoralities and the definition of that. Uh, when spoken in the Old Testament, words and ideas such as immorality, fornication, adultery often refer to spiritual unfaithfulness rather than sexual sin. However, as used of Babylon the Great, the idea of immorality and harlotry refer both to spiritual seductions and sexual issues that lead people astray from purity and cleanliness. Uh, that was my words, and in quoting Thomas again, the unclean things of her fornication further define those abominations. The adjectives in the New Testament has associations with idolatry and perhaps cult prostitution. So the harlot thrives on spreading the filthy vices and corruptions 
by allowing Earth's inhabitants to drink from her beautiful but contaminated uh, cup. And so what we're going to deal with, we dealt with allegiance to the system in the last session. This session we're going to deal with the sins that the harlot aspect of this mystery Babylon uh, releases upon the earth. So let's look next at the spirit behind the harlot. That, that'll help us to understand what we're talking about here. Let's look at the spirit behind the harlot. It, you know, going well, again, we go back to Revelation 18, and we read through Revelation 18:4. Uh, and then five talks about her sins being piled as high and six about pay back her uh, in, uh, as much as she gave out double even and to the degree seven to the degree she glorified herself and lives sensuously to the same uh, degree uh, give her torment uh, now let's look at the next verse um no, it's actually in this verse, 17. Let me read it from the beginning. Or 7, I mean, 18, 7. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow and I will never see mourning. Now that... Um, Verse of Scripture, Revelation eighteen seven, I uh, said as a queen, refers to the to the goddess of Babylon. If you, it's a quote from Isaiah chapter forty seven, uh, and so if you look at Isaiah forty six and forty seven, what you see is Isaiah forty six. Uh, Isaiah forty six talks about Bel B E L. Uh, which is another word for Marduk, which is the chief god of Babylon. And then you look at Isaiah 47, that refers to the fertility goddess, which is Ishtar uh, there, and the spirit behind Ishtar, which is the queen of heaven, which is a demonic principality uh, 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 that uh, manifested through Ishtar, which is the, the, the goddess of Babylon. And so this will help us to understand, as we understand this goddess uh, of Ishtar and the spirit behind it, will help us to understand some of the ways that this is all manifesting uh, in the earth today so that we can come out of these things and help others to come out of them, showing the importance of coming out uh, of, the, of these things. Now, before we go into the, the origins of the Queen of Heaven, um, it definitely is a something that Israel dealt with. And there's two places in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, verse 16 through 18. This is in the notes. In Jeremiah 44, 15 through 19, where the people, the Jewish people, the people uh, uh, of Israel were worshiping at the queen of heaven and giving... Uh, allegiance to the queen of heaven. And Jeremiah is confronting them, and they're, they're in these cases, they're not really paying any attention to him. But there is that spirit there. Uh, but we can trace the origin of that back at least to the Tower of Babel, because, you know, the Tower of Babel was not just some tower. It was a ziggurat or whatever, which was a, a tower, but it was also a temple and a series of temples, and it was a, a number of things. And one of the one of the aspects of the Tower of Babel was a, uh, was a temple um, to Ishtar, or a, a place of an altar to Ishtar, the fertility goddess of love and war and sex. That was worshipped at the, at the Tower of Babel. But you know the story that the Tower of Babel was destroyed and the people were scattered and everything was scattered there. But what happened was that the, the, the demonic uh, spirits that were behind Ishtar were scattered wherever the people were scattered. So they took them with them. And so you see this worship of fertility goddesses uh, of which Mystery Babylon, the great harlot, is one of those things. You see them scattered all over the earth, uh, all over the known world at, at that time. And so... 
they were worshiping different names. It wasn't always Ishtar, but the different fertility goddesses had very similar manifestations everywhere that they were worshiped. And if you begin to do some research in that and dig into some of the books that, are, that have some of this about it, you see that these practices, they, they differed somewhat from place to place, but there were very similar practices to them. There were abominations that were, took part took place in the worship of these goddesses uh, of which the queen of heaven was behind them. And so they were all very similar. And so, uh, you know, she says, I will sit as a queen and know the law and never know, uh, and, and, and not a widow and will never see mourning, but it will come upon her. It will come upon her. Uh, and we want to get out of it. We want to come out of those things before the judgment comes upon that. So the manifestations of the queen of heaven through ancient goddess worship included virtually the same practices everywhere goddess worship took place. <coughs> now let's look at some of, the, some of the examples of what took place because these will be things that are going on right now in the earth. These will be things that are happening in the earth right now uh, and God is saying, come out of those things. Don't, be, don't participate in those things. Uh, so the first one, I think I've got five different traits that were common in these, uh, where these uh, goddesses were worshipped uh, that become abominations. These were all abominations uh, and harlotries uh, to, the, to God in, in, that were practiced in those days. Uh, so the first one, there was a common practice was heterosexual and homosexual immorality and perversion. Heterosexual and homosexual immorality and perversion. And, and I'll do a little bit of reading here. Uh, goddesses were normally worshipped with ritualistic sex to cause the gods to join together, ensure, ensuring good harvest and fertility. Uh, for example, when Baal and Asherah were worshipped, People believe that the sexual union of Baal and Asherah produced fertility. And so part of the worship practice was that worshipers engaged in immoral sex to cause the gods to join together, ensuring good harvest. Uh, their pra this practice became the basis of religious prostitution. And, you know, you've, if you've read the Old Testament you know, there are a lot of places where there were, at the temple, there were temple prostitutes and all that. This was all part of that fertility goddess uh, worship fueled by the queen of heaven uh, that led people to uh, practice this in a ritualistic way in order to ensure the good harvest. Um, the priest or the male member of the community represented Baal, and this is in where Baal and Asherah worship. The priestess or a female member of the community represented the Asherah. It is said that in Corinth alone, there were more than 1,000 prostitutes in Aphrodite's temple. Augustine wrote that the Phoenicians offered a gift by prostituting uh, their daughters to Venus before uniting them to their husbands. Um, Jennifer LeClaire writes this in her book, Defeating Jezebel. Babylonian girls were steeped in fertility cult rites and offered the most precious gifts they could devote to their virginity, chastity, and modesty. Rather than bowing to the one true God, every knee bowed to the goddess. Every hand was stretched out to her, every lip revered by her name. The name was Ishtar, an alias for Semiramis and Jezebel. Uh, so what we see, and let me, let me talk a little bit about homosexuality as well. Uh, here's a, a quote from uh, Jonas Clark's book called Jezebel. There is a connection between homosexuality and the Asherah, the goddess of Jezebel worship. Asherah was worshiped in, in temples by those who had both male and female prostitutes in their services, many who were homosexual and lesbian prostitutes. In the sexual rites associated with the worship of Asherah, homosexuality was commonplace. 
And so, again, we're looking at this golden cup of abominations and unclean things of her immorality that this harlot Babylon uh, promulgated or, faci or is facilitating or pouring out uh, in the earth and the call to come out of all that to be made ready as a bride. And so, uh, you know, bringing it into today's uh, culture, uh, you know, we don't have temples to fertility goddesses in, in most of the world, but the practices are there. Uh, and we're, uh, you, you know, heterosexual uh, immorality is just rampant, uh, really, all over the earth, and as well as homosexual uh, immorality. Uh, and, and even in, uh, you know, in the West, Many, many denominations and churches are now accepting homosexuality, especially in the context of homosexual marriage, as an accepted practice in the church. Uh, and really what it is, it's, it's worshiping the queen of heaven. It's worshiping the harlot, Babylon. It's worshiping at the altar of that as people participate in those things. So that's the first one of these traits is heterosexual and homosexual immorality and perversion. And, you know, you could go on. I don't want to, no point in going on any more on that, but you could go on more of that. Another aspect of the worship that took place at these uh, temples, of, uh, goddess temples, the goddess temples of, of the fertility goddesses was drunkenness and drug use. Uh, goddess worship often included... Uh, not only licentious sexual promiscuity, but also the worshipers hallucinating through drunkenness or drug use. Uh, for example, the worship of the goddess Dionysus, participants danced and seductively, uh, danced seductively and drank intoxicating drinks, above all wine, which they believed contained the spirit of Dionysus. As they began to hallucinate, they perceived the world of the nature as supremely beautiful and sweet. They felt possessed by the goddess and in a state of extreme ecstasy, they prophesied. And so there are a lot of other examples, but there's drunkenness and drug use. And of course, uh, we know that those same things are uh, really taking place all over the world even today. Uh, uh, so that's another aspect of this uh, abomination, this cup of abominations that she holds. Now, the, uh, the third one of our five different common traits uh, that is practiced uh, and is still practiced today as well in a lot of places is witchcraft. <clears throat> uh, you know, we, we talked about earlier about the spirit behind uh, this goddess worship is the queen of heaven. Uh, and, you know, that's the verse that's quoted in Revelation 18, verse 7. Uh, and so if you go to Isaiah 47, begin to look at it, you see a lot of things. But one of the things that you see uh, is that you see phrases like, in spite of your many sorceries, uh, and this is kind of the defeat of that, uh, that goddess is what Isaiah is prophesying. In spite of your many sorceries, in spite of the great power of your spells, Evil will come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. Stand fast now in your spells and in your many sorceries. Let now the astrologers and those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons, are sprinkled through the chapter. These things are sprinkled through the chapter of Isaiah 47. So what you see is that, you know, she's the mother, uh, this is what our, the spiritual father used to say, the queen of heaven is, is the mother, god, mother goddess of witchcraft. And so, you know, in Africa where we do a lot of work and there's a tremendous amount of witchcraft there, that's part of, the, uh, of that queen of heaven, part of this whole fertility goddess worship and, and all of those uh, things uh, as well. We have to come out of those things. So for the African church, and, uh, and I know that our leaders and are not involved in these things, but we have to be a voice to call 
Uh, and it's not just Africa. It's really all over the world. But we, we have to call them out. You can't practice witchcraft uh, and then be a part of the bride. There's, you, you, you have to come out of all that and, and come into Christ, into the practice of, uh, of the faith there as well. So that's the, the, the witchcraft. And the next one is control. Fertility goddesses were almost universally goddesses of love, war, and sex. And as such, they used th these things to control uh, their inheritance through these traits. Um, as, a, as mentioned earlier, young virgins were required to give them Selves to someone other than their husbands before they could marry. And to do this is an act of worship of the goddess. In the way sex was used to control worshipers. Uh, these things also produced strife and discord and contention and rivalry and all sorts of things like that. And so there's a part of the abomination is this independent spirit, this spirit of control. Uh, that separates people from uh, biblical authority, from uh, authority of pastoral leadership, uh, even in homes and marriages and things like that, uh, to raise up uh, just something that's out of, out of order. Even if you go to read those two passages in Jeremiah that I talked about, it was the women that were offering these, uh, ra these cakes to the queen of heaven and the men were trying to get him to do it but the women said that to stop it but the women said they weren't going to do it uh, you know so it's that independence and that control a divine disorder uh, that is there uh, and then so the next one uh, I think this might be the yeah the, the fifth one uh, is emasculation of men uh, you know one of the things that happened uh, some in these uh, temple worship encounters is that the men would castrate themselves. I mean, this is disgusting. All of this is really. Uh, they would castrate themselves in a way to uh, to honor this fertility goddess, and they would uh, they would dance uh, before them uh, in in that sense, that sense. They would work themselves at times up into a frenzy, uh, and they would then castrate themselves and. Uh, give themselves to the fertility goddess. They would do that, and then some would just, uh, uh, you know, put makeup on them and all sorts of things like that to just to uh, make them more, uh, identify more with this queen of heaven. And, of course, we see all sorts of this kind of stuff happening in the West right now. You know, some of the transgender stuff that's going on recently and, uh, you know, the drag queen shows to children and all the stuff that's just horrible that's going on. All of this is fueled by this queen of heaven and the, and the, the abominations that, uh, that this harlot is releasing uh, upon uh, the earth. And men are being emasculated. Uh, you know, you see it even, not even in, in some of these uh, just really grotesque things that we see, even on just on television and, uh, you know, just TV shows, commercials and things like that, you always see the woman as the wise one and the man is like a buffoon, you know. The, the man can't even figure out whether to get, to, how to buy insurance or something and the woman is so wise and she tells him how to do it and all that. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with women being wise, but it makes the men seem emasculated. Uh, and so this is all part of that, that uh, movement uh, of this harlot. She's trying to pour out all of this type of stuff uh, over her. So let's see how this queen of heaven manifests uh, today in today's society. I mean, I've already touched on a good bit of it already, but uh, the queen of heaven manifests today with many of the same traits as occurred in ancient times. The same thing is happening. I mean, people aren't going to a temple to Ishtar uh, to worship Ishtar and do all these things. But it's happening all over. All of this stuff is happening all over the, all over the earth. And it, in a sense, it is worshiping the harlot, the great harlot, 
uh, the, 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 you know, filling her cup of abominations. Um, so uh, it's manifesting all over the, the, the earth. Now, sexual immorality and sexual perversion permeate today's global cur culture. Uh, you know, I don't know that we need to even really elaborate on that. Anybody, we would all know that that is just totally true happening right now. Global culture emasculates men, taking them from biblical authority figures that they inten are intended to be. So there's a divine disorder that has taken place. Drunkenness and drug use also permeate uh, today's culture. Uh, that for sure is happening as well. The queen of heaven is leading people into false religions and religious compromise, uh, certainly in the religious compromise. And, and you know, you, it's just one of the largest evangelical movements in, in, in the Georgia where we live uh, the, the pastor is, is um, basically come out and accepting the homosexual lifestyle as a as a acceptable lifestyle uh, in, according to his interpretation of the scriptures. So there's a lot of this type of thing happening, and in, in, uh, you know, the, just different things that are uh, going on there. Uh, the Queen of Heaven is also the basis for the occult and for witchcraft that is going on uh, around the world. Uh, today. Abortion is the modern day human sacrifice in the same manner in which children were offered in a, to ancient pagan offer, altars. You know, Marduk was, uh, was the Babylonian god and he was one that, to which human sacrifice was, was offered. And abortion is the modern day equivalent of that. Um, the Queen of Heaven will, will lead believers to attempt to control others, to live independently of God's ordained uh, order. Uh, so there's, there's, there's that as well. And so what is the Lord saying? He's, you know, going back to our verse uh, of Scripture, Revelation 18, 4, he's saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins. In other words, don't participate in her sins. So, you know, I imagine the people, those of you who are listening to this are not participating in any of these gross abominations and immoralities that are, that are taking place. But the people you speak to, the people in your churches may be. Because the culture, it, these things have permeated our culture. And the Lord is saying... <clears throat> to us, come out of these things. Don't participate in these sins. You know, the voice of the bride, these things will, the bride will not be participating in these, in these things. The bride made ready will have come out of these things, will have come out of these gross abominations and immoralities and the witchcraft and the all of the different issues that are there. You can't be right with God and be practicing these sort, talk, sorts of things. And so for the bride to be made ready, she must come out of all participation with the sins of Babylon and the tentacles of the queen of heaven. It's absolutely necessary that this take place. The bride must separate from people, places, and things connected with this, the evils of this in the world. So, you, you know, you, you, can't just, you can't just go and be, hang out with people who are doing these things. Uh, you need to come out of all that. You need to come out of the places come out of a relationship with a close relationship with the people that are involved in these things because they, bad company corrupts good morals. So there's a separation that's been, that the, the church is being called to. Uh, and the bride must separate from the snares of the harlot Babylon in body, soul, and spirit. And so there's a real call to come out of all this, 
Not only the allegiance, you know, we talked about that in the last session, and that's a big part of it. But not only the allegiance to the system, we must also come out of participation in these sins that are being fueled by this harlot, the abominations of this great, uh, this great harlot. For they are being promulgated all over the earth, and the bride has to come out of those things. The voice of the bride must be pure. The bride must be pure and clean and holy. So come out of her, my people, participation and allegiance, but also the sins of this great harlot. So let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would touch each and every one of us who are listening to this, watching this, to help us come out of these things, oh God. Help us come out of these things. We need your grace. We need your, we need your grace. We need your favor. We need your voice. We need your power, both for the allegiance and the sins. And we ask you, Father, to help us. We need your help. And we ask, Father, that you would do it. That you would do it. Help us to come out of her, my people, that we do not participate in their sins and receive of her plagues because we want to be a bride made ready, pure and clean and undefiled. So we ask, Lord, now and as we continue our walk through life that you help us to be that bride made ready. And we pray these things in, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen.